All right, thanks everyone for uh, coming to this post-lunch uh, session on um, uh, um, the European Health Data Space. My name is Sven Gitzela. I'm a media theorist. I'm also an artificial intelligence researcher, and I'm also involved in the um, a regional healthcare and AI innovation network. And um, I find this topic particularly relevant because the question of what data spaces are and what we do in these data spaces is not just an infrastructure conversation, it's also a design conversation that needs to involve people who usually don't think about technology. And um, we have on this panel uh, people who will speak from a variety of perspectives um, on the implementation of this vision, which is part of the European Union's agenda to reclaim what they call technological sovereignty vis-a-vis uh, -vis the laissez-faire Americans they see in the United States and the authoritarian uh, technology development models they see in the East. And so this is a fairly ambitious agenda, this uh, data space agenda. The healthcare data space is not the only one, but it is one of those significant ones because healthcare data, as you all know, is perhaps the most sensitive data. And so all the conflicts we have in the development of data-driven business models, data ethics, et cetera, we have in this healthcare conversation. So without further ado, I would then like to um, ask our first speaker, uh, Oliver Stenzer to briefly introduce himself and then share with us uh, the state of play in his working group uh, on the Scandal Forum. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sunke. Uh, happy to be with you today and happy to have the possibility to explain what we are doing in Scanbald uh, on the digital health uh, topic. And I would like to share my screen with you to show some, some slides, just a second. So I hope you can see it now. I would, would like to give a brief introduction about Scanbald so that you can see from what perspective we are dealing with the digital health data space. Um, Scanbald. Scanbald is an organization from the Baltic Sea region. It brings together innovation clusters uh, from the Baltic and the Scandinavian area. So we have a huge uh, footprint of uh, um, German innovation clusters um, from the northern part of Germany, for example, from Berlin, from Mecklenburg-Vorpommern and Hamburg, Schleswig-Holstein. But we also have a, a really interesting and relevant footprint from, from Poland as, uh, in my view, re really ambitious uh, EU um, partner when it comes to digital health topics and artificial intelligence. And we have the already well-known Baltic Sea region for um, its really um, highly um, yeah, imp improved and um, known digital health uh, system they have established from uh, first in, in Estonia, but also in the other countries. I think Andre will talk about this later. Scanwald is a typical cluster organization. We offer, um, yeah, you know, all this portfolio, what uh, a cluster organization offers to its members. We uh, will be a think tank for new ideas from the region. We will uh, accelerate projects together. We make matchmaking and network activities and we form a community which brings together all the experts from, from the region. So this is a special point, what I would like to highlight here, uh, what we are doing uh, with Kanbal, we are trying to shape EU policy to cluster organizations. So, and uh, this is the relation to the digital health topic uh, when it comes to EU politics. So what we see is that we all uh, are talking about health innovation, but we have, um, uh, on the EU agenda, the health topic formerly seen as a cost factor. And we have this lack of digitalization, which limits really research and development in Europe. So we, we are really high uh, when it comes to talking ab about digital health, but we are very low when it comes to concrete implementation. And we see that all science clusters face this similar challenges and the lack of um, digitalization is a limitation 
on any cluster activity within Europe. So our aim is to bring the clusters from the different areas of Europe together, not only from the Baltic Sea country, but also from Southern and Eastern European um, parts to, to act together and to lobby together towards Brussels for more digital health activities and for a clear vision what, what will be the core element of digital health for Europe. And in our view, this uh, core element will be um, the regional activities. And this is what we highlighted during the German EU Council presidency last year. Um, this, uh, what we brought in as partner of the German government as part of the official program from, from Germany for its um, um, activities was that we brought together different cluster organizations from all over Europe to talk together about the challenges when it comes to the European health data space and to talk from a regional perspective about it so that uh, we do not have only this commission view, view and this um, Brussels policy driven view on the European health data space, but that we uh, let's speak up the regions about uh, what's on the agenda when it comes to digital health. And you see here the different cluster organizations we could bring together for our conference. You see that they came from all over Europe. Uh, we have a huge footprint in Southern Europe, but we also had really active partners from the Eastern European parts. And um, we formed together a really high uh, alliance of cluster organizations. So, and what we did together was uh, we formulated a joint declaration, the joint declaration towards the European common health data space what picked up the yeah, crucial uh, situation from last year when it comes to COVID-19 uh, management. And uh, we highlighted the bottlenecks we, they, that were visible last year uh, when it comes to um, cooperation in Europe, border cross-border cooperation and the, on the treatment of patients and on the pan pandemic activities. And um, for us, this was really the highlight when uh, we wanted to show what are the limitations of this European data space that we were not able to communicate cross-border and that um, from the Brussels side, there was yeah, a lot of inactivity um, for really concrete um, management of the disease and of the pandemic. And we highlighted what regional activities were able to do. And um, we asked them to write down what, from their perspective, are the challenges and the next steps we should take to establish a really working European health data space. And I think what was really crucial that this is not a limiting uh, activity. It was not limited to the German council presidency activities, but we opened it for the upcoming presidencies to pick up this initiative. And we collaborated with Portuguese partners and Slovenian partners, and they uh, used their presidency activities um, to bring up uh, this um, joint declaration to their governments and elaborated the um, activity further. So we highlighted three relevant points. Uh, it's, I think, nothing new for you. Um, we focused on data privacy issues. We talked about interoperability and um, the next steps uh, to strengthen Euro European institutions. And when it comes to data privacy, there was a highly commitment to the uh, really data privacy um, within Europe. GDPR was mentioned as a core instrument that we should, should use to um, bring forward our privacy activities and that data sharing should be enabled, enabled between the cluster organizations. Um, data protection is a topic to be better coordinated between the European member states and that high security standards is a core element that we need, that we need for any other 
um, activity uh, on data sharing. So I think nothing new for you, but what was for us important that this is a common view that any region of Europe has the same um, objective when we talk about data privacy. The same on interoperability. Um, the connectivity and the um, interoperability uh, is really the core element um, for data exchange. And um, in the um, Scandinavian area, we, we saw a lot of interoperability already established. But uh, for example, when, when it comes to Germany and cross-border um, activities, we see a, a huge lack you know that even within Germany, we, we cannot talk about interoperability. And um, this is also more important when we talk about cross-border cooperation. Um, tracing app was a special point in the last year. So this was really uh, high on the agenda because these tracing apps and uh, the connectivity between Europe was um, the key for further um, activities and for example, limiting travel um, restrictions. Um, so we put really a high effort on how we could bring together tracing app activities from different countries in a common system, what now is more or less established. Yeah, strengthening the European institutions is, is really the, the core. So we should develop um, European databases, we should develop digital registers uh, of medical supply um, to allow to really coordinate uh, medical um, activities at EU level. Um, we should see more coordinating cross-border healthcare initiatives and um, we should uh, support uh, the broadening and deepening of telemedicine and telecare not only within the European countries, but uh, on a cross-border level. Um, and more or less uh, the really main point was that, that we uh, asked for more activities to strengthen the digital health literacy for the empowerment of the European citizens, that we really need more um, knowledge about the possibilities and the quality of digital health activities within the citizenship of Europe. So this was one other instrument that we would like to highlight. Um, I can put the uh, link to this uh, declaration in the chat. So you all have the possibility to have a short view on it. And what now is important that we would pick up this initiative with regard to the French Council presidency, which starts next year, first half of 22. And um, when I look at the further program, we will talk about Gaia X activities. I think everything Germany and France are doing together within the next uh, uh, six months during the French presidency will have an impact on this European health data space. And uh, the Gaia X activities will really be a core element of of this European data space. And we as Kanbad would like to invite you to join our activity. Perhaps there are some French clusters uh, in the chat and in, in, in the um, conference today um, that are interested to join our activity. And we are, we are really willing to um, put our activities um, towards the French council presidency and uh, will highly appreciate if some interests uh, are coming from the French side towards um, our Scanbalt initiative. So, so this was more or less a short overview about our activities. I Thanks hope much, I, I, I could, is, um... could give you an impression what we are doing and what we are willing to do. And yeah, looking forward to our conversation. Thank you. My suggestion, thanks much. My suggestion would be that we hold some of the questions until the next, uh, after the next two presentations, because they, they sort of um, are complementary. And uh, um, so the one thing that Oliver said that essentially when we think about Europe, we think about regions, 
and a network of regions where this innovation dynamics will have to be um, um, initiated and sustained. And so now we'll hear from Andre Nitschmann, who will speak to us from the digital yes. health master uh, Lithuania. Okay, it's all you. Um, Just one second. You okay, Andre? I am okay. I just understood that on my computer was not this, uh, the screen sharing activated. Okay. Uh, my, my mistake as an uh, okay, but okay. One second. That was. So maybe I start already uh, saying who I am and what I'm doing. So my name is Andre. I'm a German coming from the city of Cottbus, but living in Riga, Latvia. I'm a co-founder of the Digital Health Cluster in Latvia. And we have founded this cluster like three years ago. And uh, two years ago, we have joined the uh, Scandals Cluster. Um, no. Now you should hear me there. See? And my presentation will be about the patient journey. So when I've joined with my team, the digital or the standard custom, we understood actually that the big potential of Latvia is um, the how to say the scalability of microservices we have a quite a nice ecosystem which actually allows to connect with the patients to test smart services and um, yeah to overcome actually the technocracy because our policy makers are quite interested um, yeah to develop the digital space and uh, in this context they have strongly uh, invested and continue investing into the ecosystem on measure one, not only the digital health field, but uh, especially in fintech and uh, yeah, legal services, uh, but healthcare is growing and growing because um, we have about three and a half thousand foreign students studying in Riga medicine. And uh, actually the Riga Stavins University is quite well known also in Europe for quite a lot of yeah, remarkable names in, in healthcare, especially uh, when it comes to hard topics. So we have there some success factors uh, on our behalf, which means we have good resources, we have know-how, we have a supportive environment. And um, yeah, the big question was to me, what comes next from all out of this? Because uh, I also understood that uh, the Latvian ecosystem was quite fresh, or it's still even quite fresh, we are growing and um, nobody knows us. Yeah. Okay, I'm not talking like a German being in Latvia. Uh, so. And that might be also the reason why I'm talking about this, because I've seen that the potential of the ecosystem is strong and the relationships with international partners is also good. And uh, yeah, thanks to Oliver, I am now here to strengthen this relationship in this patient journey, because the patient journey itself is very similar. Uh, we have the patient uh, who's actually served by national regulations in healthcare. So reimbursement schemes are usually a national topic. Healthcare policy is a national topic. And uh, meanwhile, the patient itself is an inhabitant working and traveling around Europe and around the globe. That means actually the freedom of travel and the freedom of service is much more common than you recognize it. Meanwhile, healthcare services are still limited to our 
national frameworks where we are living in. So as a registered uh, citizen of a country. And on the other hand, it means, okay, if, if it takes a classical healthcare services, we can start to develop them ahead and say, okay, there are core services which are provided just through the infrastructure, to the people at one spot. But there are a lot of components which will come from the digital part. We really could talk about smart services, which could be easily exported, which also would go with the European perspective of this, that services are also free traveling, accessible everywhere and usable everywhere. So basically the technocracy part is reducing in the digital space. The big question is, how can we make it happen that the national individual systems are working together, which is one of the reasons why the standby declaration for the common European data health space is for me quite important and a, a topic to work on in the next, well, during this planning period of the EU framework, because, um, it somehow makes no, no sense uh, that we have the environments that people can travel, that services can travel, that products can travel, but actually national core functionalities are bordered. And this also means that the ecosystems can grow and the ecosystems are not li limited anymore to a hotspot in a special country, but yeah, it would mean, for example, that we have this German, French, Latvian connection maybe, yeah, where we source actually this specific know-how, specific infrastructure to build new solutions. And then it's a question again, what comes next? And it is a journey. I mean, now digital today for me a bit challenging because I'm participating in today also in a hackathon. And a hackathon is a journey for me too. And I understand that this journey of a hackathon means yeah, we are producing or trying to build up this year uh, or this week a new service which we might be able to serve to other countries. And all depends on this, that I'm uh, uh, empowering and engaging with, uh, with the patient, first of all, now I feel. Uh, why empowering uh, the, the patient? Um, the hierarchy we have in our, let's say, common economic system means actually that everything is centralized planned somehow. Meanwhile, we are going to the direction of personalized medicine, uh, customized services. And that means, okay, the patient knows more and more about his status and uh, his health uh, level. And that means we have to engage him to know earlier what is possible so that we could improve then the healthcare systems. And that's a starting point for me. It's not anymore that we're talking about we're providing healthcare services to the citizens. It's more about, okay, how we keep our citizens healthy uh, to make them say what they need and what they want, which services would meet them best. And also the service will be uh, distributed. Where are the experts? So an example, for example, is rare disease patients. Uh, actually, the European law says that, uh, or regulation says that uh, patients have the opportunity to get treated in every European country and the reimbursement schemes uh, of the all national countries should cover this. Again, the Latvian uh, rare disease patients are far beyond this luxury and they would appreciate it. Uh, we have a lack of experts in Latvia, but the state is not ready uh, to compensate this yet, that they are traveling somewhere else. So that means the collaboration actually on the national level is missing at this point on the countries uh, and should be strengthened in the startup space. And uh, it means that the patient is actually the one who should be the trigger to fill into the system the information or to, to request that the information about his health records are accessible. And it comes also that actually the economic models or the, the business models we have, they have to be restructured. We are now all working mostly goal on how, yeah. but what is if we have to outcome oriented? Then we are not we are predicting the, uh, the results, yeah? we are awaiting the results, and then we And that's a complete shift to the next direction. And so then the question on you know, the digital forum is hard to answer it in one to one, but what I would like to accomplish is uh, uh, yeah, how can we work together on this? What do we need for ourselves? And what could be next steps?
our approach in general is we start with the people, we find joint organizations uh, or found organizations on the national level, go with Scanbot or uh, hopefully also with the bridge to, 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 to Thailand and beyond, and have an influence on the policy making to ensure a proper economic framework. And these are then also the building blocks to, to, to build something new up, which is going beyond borders. The collaboration is, yeah, is fruitful due to, the, due to the fact of collaboration. And there's yeah, ed in Latvia, especially is about digitalization uh, in healthcare, um, in life science also. And this will have also an influence on the policy making in general because I have to say that the Latvians and the Estonian. Uh, we briefly lost you there, Andre. Yeah. But maybe, maybe you can wrap up because we might be able to discuss some of the questions you have already raised um, in the group later. Are you okay with that? Andre? Andre, yes. still there? Yes, Are you okay I'm with wrapping up now? Because I think some of the questions you raised, we'd be happy to discuss in the larger group later because I'm sure everybody else has related questions. Like, sure. What do we do? What do we do together? What do we do alone? Um, yeah. All right. Um, the question of regions and networking efforts across regions has already been a topic in several presentations. So I'm very happy to introduce our next um, speaker from Luxembourg who is already interested in transporter use cases. Uh, and we're intrigued to hear what it is that you have in mind there. Oh, I'm sorry, did I get, did I get this wrong? Yes. I'm, uh, yes, yes, yes. So I, I, I'm here. Uh, my name is Wolf Nebers. I'm the head of the Luxembourg Institute of Health. I also am involved in a project uh, called Clinova and uh, uh, Luxembourg and the NIH is currently a leader of One Health Initiative, the trans-European one in GAIAX. So now, I try to tell you what we do, and I uh, will try to do it quickly. I have to share my screen. Um, that would be, I think. So ideally, you see it in presentation mode, or is it is it a full screen or presentation mode? I never know. Right now, we get it in presentation mode and not in the screen. Okay, is it better now? Yes. Good. So, um, the Luxembourg Institute of Health is a translation health institute, and so we work on precision medicine and how can we effectively bring the research advances uh, concretely to the patient. Um, we are um, for a period now for six months a leader in a um, European Health Consortium of Gaia X. You know that Gaia X uh, has a headquarter organization, Gaia X AISBL. Um, it's mostly a private driven initially. It was mostly a private driven initiative. And um, it has divided its overall working scope into three committees policy rules, data spaces, and the technical committees. Within the technical committees, there have been some bottom up. Uh, initiatives. And uh, so, for example, in health, there is a self constituted initiative that was initially driven by Bert Verdonk uh, from Belgium and Jana Sinipuro from Finland. And they got together the European health community, all of the national hubs that are involved in uh, the health sector. Out of this working group now, we are putting, uh, we, are, we are transforming it in a more, uh, in a more organized endeavor. We have defined a uh, governance structure. How do we organize um, what we want to do and what are the goals that we are following up? So we have uh, work packages on use cases, on communication and on liaison with the other sectors, notably agriculture, energy, finance, mobility, and so on. Of course, it's also very important to keep in mind the European health data space. How are they connected? I can tell you in a few words the way I understood it because I was a lot of learning when you got into it. GAIA-X is a bit like the operational part, the bottom-up part, where people that have an interest, uh, business or research in the GAIA-X health field, 
they are starting to drive projects, whereas the um, health data space is more of the regulatory initiative. It's from the public side. It's uh, more of a top-down thing. And this is very important that there is a close uh, interaction between GAIA-X health, in that case, and the European health data space, because imagine it's a little bit like with a GDPR regulation. There's a lot of good in the regulation that are coming down in Europe in order to give planning safety. But on the other hand, there has to be pushback. There has to be a very clear articulation what our needs and how does the regulation have, have to be done in a way that it furthers and not inhibit the activities that we are all engaged in. So um, these are the two main players, I think, as far as I am concerned, as we are moving forward in the health data space in health, GAIA-X and European health data space and this interaction has to be has to be done in a, a um, well, in a purpose-oriented fashion. Now, in order to allow that, uh, we have to move a little bit away from the very theoretical discussions that we have in the national hubs. What is GAIA-X? What do we do? And actually nail it uh, in two points. I mean, come up with concrete use cases. That has already started happening in the national hubs. And uh, the initiative, the bottom-up initiative that I told you, they have a list of national use cases that are being followed up in GAIA-X. But it's important to also, of course, remember that there's a very clear European dimension to it. And so really what is important is to look at concrete use cases that go beyond national hubs to forge a European dimension. And of course, if you have a national uh, initiative, if you are able to build it and to extend it transborder, um, it has more impact uh, on the European level. And of course, it gains in significance and long-term sustainability. Often, that also for furthers the uh, commercial interest that may be coming along with a project. Good. So um, that is um, <clears throat> what has happened. We have a number of national use cases. We have come up with a database where the national use cases are being um, are, are being deposited. And in addition, we now have started building concretely transporter use cases. They aim at stress testing and aligning critical enablers on the European level. Um, the terminology in GAIA-X is such that an enabler is um, a positive way of looking at something that could be blocking. If you de-block it, it does become an enabler. And enablers are IP regulation, interoperability, cybersecurity, um, and so on and so on. So these critical enablers taken from a European perspective can only really be stress tested if there are projects that go across borders. And uh, of the types that we have identified, there are only very few that are already funded. There are several where funding um, uh, is being um, is being looked for, uh, and some others, there's nothing on the horizon. And it is very clear that if we want to move forward with building the Gaia X health space, we do need to define um, a dedicated funding format. And this could be uh, part of the funds that are available for the European health data space. It could be in the framework of the next, uh, um, uh, uh, the European uh, research framework agreement that there we will be able to impact on the decision makers to reserve funds for transporter projects. Nonetheless, I want to give you some of the projects that uh, we have identified. There is one in Luxembourg that extends into France and into Germany, uh, now also into Switzerland on precision health. There is a uh, idea <coughs> um, on rare diseases that comes from France. Uh, incidentally, it is also being picked up uh, from Italy. So there's a possibility that France and Italy in this network will combine and get funding from the reserve funds in order to pull this off. We have uh, a very interesting suggestion from Berlin, uh, looking at the secondary health market and there um, they're looking at DIGAS, uh, digital health uh, applications, and how DIGAS could actually be uh, arranged such that uh, they can be used and also reimbursed across borders. So there are very many enablers that can be addressed in that example. And there is a gastroenterology 
example from Lettland. So what we have decided now um, in the in the executive team in the steering team that we will try to get as many uh, transporter projects as possible and then try to define common enablers. We have specialists working on what these enablers could look like and then play that back to the policymakers and also play it back and the requirements we learn into the European health data space. Um, I would like to, um, and so here you can see and how we are looking at common enablers that, uh, that, that will then be looking across the various use cases and here the teams are being put in place. Very quickly, uh, I want to give you a concrete example that we have picked. This is a, a, a project called Klinova. And it involves uh, the Saarland, uh, the FKI and the University of the Saarland. It uh, involves the Grand Est with um, Metz Nancy, uh, but also Reims, uh, Strasbourg, uh, Baden Württemberg, uh, Freiburg, Heidelberg, Mannheim, and I think Ulm, and uh, uh, all of the major entities in Luxembourg. So here we have a situation where there is a precision health initiative that goes across borders and it allows us then to very clearly define um, the stress test that we have to do. This project is trying to look at uh, artificial intelligence in healthcare, how to use it effectively. I have listed here a number of upsides that we all hope we can gain if in the end this would become a real tangible uh, possibility. But before you can really be good at AI and healthcare, you have to look at a high initial capital requirement, GDPR concerns, there's a reluctance of medical practitioners, obviously a lack of curated data and a total lack of interoperability. If we are looking at where this topic is standing now worldwide, not only in Europe, you would imagine AI and healthcare has thrived a lot, but um, not to disappoint you, but there is something called the Gartner hype cycle. It looks at evolving technologies and the uh, remarkable points to point out here. There is the innovation trigger, the peak of inflated expectations, and here then the trough of disillusionment. And if you look at uh, experts, and there are probably several in the audience, where are we? I hope we are at the bottom of the whole thing and not still on our way down. But the failure of the IBM Watson oncology in the US certainly highlights the problem that we have if we are looking at this topic. So this is the concrete challenge for this network, this transporter network that is being set up. Um, the idea is that the innovation driver is not in the algorithm. But the innovation driver is lying in the data enabling environment, and that goes across borders, number one, but also it lies in the production of standardized and quality controlled data because they don't exist. So if you so want, the IBM Watson, Watson Oncology, it failed probably, well, it didn't fail. The Watson was marginally worse than any general uh, oncologist did not make it even to the level of uh, an average specialist in the field. It probably failed because the data that were used are retrospective. That means they were not quality controlled at all. And so it failed. Now what we do is we build what is called prospective cohorts. We recruit patients and we start treating them in a standardized way from today into the future. And so we have a control over the quality of data we generate. If we get clean standardized data, we can then train algorithms. And these algorithms should progressively be able to also mine in retrospective data sets. And that is the idea that really tied in all of the clinicians. And we, we, we looked at diseases, big disease groups, you know, rheumatoid arthritis is a very mature market. So is IBD, multiple sclerosis together that involves 30 million patients and there are 55 billion euros being spent every year. But just to tell you, no physician in this area knows what drug to prescribe to what patient. They simply have no idea. There are new drugs coming every week and the doctors suffer from not being able to be more precise. And of course, the patients suffer because they do not get the right help. And so here is the goal. We work together simply to find which early markers allow us to really assign the right drug to the right patient. And so the data that we get from the patient 
they are then being standardized. And after two to three years, we will have a personal treatment choice. And it is important here that in that transporter consortium, the very patient that gives the data will profit from the data. And once, of course, the data are there, there's a lot of additional research that can be done. Important are the people that are involved in these various diseases. There are leading clinicians. They usually always want to do their own thing. We have convinced them to work in lockstep, do exactly the same regime for their patients, and that has worked for all of the various disease areas. What is also important is that we have a centralized processing of samples through a structure in uh, Luxembourg called uh, the IBBL, that is a biobank. And when it comes to data safety and security, we are building a federated data environment in which we will leave the data locally in data integration centers, and we will develop algorithms that are able to do remote analysis. And there the DFKE in Saarbrücken will be a very important uh, contributor with AI. Um, so this is the interoperability team that has been put into place. So we are starting to look at the various enablers and testing uh, how this is going. What is very important is that in the in the data in the data world, health data belong to the patients. They are not the property of a company. Now, when you are thinking about commercializing these data and, and commercializing health data is not a bad thing. <laughs> Let me tell you, from a research site, when you have uh, um, uh, a precursor for a new drug or a new diagnostic, we of course do not have the financial means to go all the way to the patient. So we do have to secure at one point private co-investment. But it is very difficult to, at the moment, do that in, in, the, um, in the health sector because there's simply no planning safety. And that is what, in all of the now transborder areas, we have to create. And that is the idea and the concept of a public trusted partner. The public trusted partner gives planning safety to the uh, private um, players that come in. They are taking care of pseudonymization. GDPR compliance, cybersecurity, data storage, analysis tool, and interoperability. And what is very important is that in a trusted public partnership, you cannot only have the health data, you have to look at many other data sets and they have to be interoperable if you want to go in the direction of uh, prevention. And so IP regulation and revenue sharing, very important. This has to be defined as we are moving forward. It's a little bit off. So now here I have explained to you a very concrete use mm -hmm. case where we can look at enablers. How do we share the revenue? How do we deal with IP regulations? How do we make sure that interoperability is okay? How can we build analysis tools that are actually crawling and just bring back, uh, uh, um, not of course, not the original data? All of these specific questions will now be addressed. This project Clinova is at the moment fully financed, so we are not having to look for additional funding sources. But that is a good example of how we do need very concrete examples if we want to bring the, uh, well, our ambition, our um, ambition forward, um, well, on the basis of concrete measures and how they can look. Um, Okay, and so there is uh, the leadership team that we are now building up, and uh, we will go further with that. There is a possibility in the future of maybe building an association around that, similar to the way that Katina X has done it in the car industry. A lot of moving parts, I can assure you, but we have to be confident and uh, move into this uh, entirely new world, confident, but still uh, stepwise and systematically. And I think this basically what I wanted to present in this context today. Thanks much for this comprehensive plea for cooperation and uh, use case development. Before we jump back into the Gaia-X conversation, so clearly the part of the session, I guess, would be to think about transporter Gaia-X use cases. We also have some ideas on that. I think we're actually meeting with part of your team next week at MECO uh, okay. on this yeah. uh, question Very of good. how health AI might relate to uh, and build on Cronova. But precisely because this is not just about funded research by people who develop actual business model, 
um, uh, cases here. I want to uh, welcome uh, Michael Ringswandel here. I'm sorry I skipped you because I thought there would be a link between you know the regional perspectives. Uh, so I pushed you back one slot. But let's hear it from Collective Thinking um, now. Great, uh, sound good. Thank you very much um, for the introduction. Um, my name is Michael Ringswandel from Collective Thinking and. Uh, yeah, um, like you introduced me before, uh, we're really going back now to a company um, perspective um, from, yeah, um, to see where the data comes from and um, to do these researches, to do this clustering. And um, I will try to give you an overview about our approach at uh, Collective Thinking. So uh, Collective Thinking, um, was a research company um, and founded already in 2013 in uh, Paris. And um, we worked for uh, different industries and sectors until 2015 and 2016. Um, from this time, we had a first client uh, a hospital chain called Elsan um, in France. And um, this was the moment where we completely concentrated on the health sector and we're working um, right now um, the last four years um, for hospitals to help them analyzing their patient data. So um, how do we do that? We are, like I said, an artificial intelligence company, which is dedicated right now to uh, hospitals, but also to other healthcare institution. And um, we want to help to simplify and accelerate, improve the quality of medical data for further clinical studies. You said that before, um, Ulf, when you were presenting, um, AI is great, but AI needs a good quality of data. It needs a lot of data. And um, this is um, why, um, where our, business model and our system comes a little bit place. I try to give you a an, an, an quick overview and I hope I can sum it up in the end. Natalie, if you would be um, so nice um, to go on the next um, thing. Yeah, I said um, data. We have in the hospitals, um, I mean, we have in Germany 1,900 hospitals. Um, in France, I think it's a little bit less, but still 1,500. Every day we're having patients um, there um, coming with yeah, um, easy um, or uh, regular um, illnesses and problems, but also a bit more complicated. So we have really a huge pot of data, completely unstructured. Um, it needs to be sorted, arranged and present and otherwise you cannot work with that. And that is the, the basic case. Most of this data is never got used because there's no way to, to work with it. First of all, um, not all hospitals are very digital. Um, I see there between France and Germany a uh, difference. In France, we are a little bit more digital in the hospital sector. In um, Germany, the big um, hospitals, the university hospitals, they have um, very good systems. But um, if it goes a little bit down to the region and um, smaller um, yeah, local uh, hospitals, then uh, we we really talking different and the infrastructure um, crew, the IT infrastructure in these hospitals grow organic and that causes really a huge um, problem for them to use their data. So what we do um, for research normally in the hospital, uh, they are not a lot, not a lot of money. Um, so we try to 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 build um, a system for the hospitals where they can earn additional money in order then to use that also for clinical studies. And I will explain you that um, quite quickly. Natalie, could we go to the next slide, please? So um, I think, and I go pretty quickly over that, um, the case-based hospital payment system. Um, I think everybody knows what I'm talking about here. Um, it's a DRG system where basically um, the uh, hospital is not um, paid by the patient, but it is paid by the health insurer. And while the health insurer is indirectly remunerated by the patients through contribution. And in order to get this reimbursement for the health insurer, the hospital must send a detailed description of the care provided to the patient. And this is done by uh, so-called medical coding. And um, for the medical coding, on the next slide, Natalie, please. 
Um, this is carried out by a department um, in the hospital, which is um, responsible for medical information. And um, this department needs to identify and collect key information from the patient's electronic health record, also called EHR. In particular, um, as well as the medical procedures uh, performed during the hospital stay, uh, hospital stay um, these will determine the price for the case uh, that the hospital is able to charge to the health insurer, which um, secures their budget um, and enables them um, to, to plan also for the next year. So this um, point is like crucial for the hospitals and um, that's why we started at, uh, at this point um, to, uh, to create the, the business model. So how does it work? Um, when we watch on the another um, slides, um, Natalie, you know that is this uh, slide with the, with the seven um, slides right now, we have a lot of information there. And these informations are pretty difficult to, to analyze. Uh, the medical coding team has to analyze the diagnose, they have to um, identify um, the procedure man, the medications. Um, there are a lot of reports, letters, biological resorts, um, on and on and on. And this relevant information must be coded. And this information for the coding is in free texts here. So that is very tedious to study. And um, that causes problems because now we're coming back um, to the DRG system, which I mentioned before, that's one slide after. Um, in every country, we have a different DRG system. All works a little bit on the ICD-10 um, coding, but um, for all of these diagnoses and, um, and, and, and procedures, they have to find the right code. And these larger of possible diagnosis codes, the complexity of the rule system, the volume of the data I showed before to be analyzed and the limitation of the current available software makes this activity very time consuming and costly. And like I said before, with a high potential error rate leading to the significant impacts on hospital revenues, but also later on in the data, because then we have really not good treatment data, which we work, can work on for clinical studies. It's time confusing, it's error prone, and yeah, it has this impact on the hospital, which is in the moment the most important for the hospitals, because a huge number of hospitals they have budget problems. And um, well, that is another discussion if we need these amounts of hospitals or not. But I think COVID gave us a different point of view here again, that we maybe should have also regional hospitals, which are not only centralized. It's another discussion, like I said. So our solution now, it's intelligent for health. Um, it's uh, patented AI-based coding assistance software, which works on two bases. One, we have a semantic um, base, and then we have the machine learning base. That helps us to gather, first of all, by a rule system, by an expert system, to connect all these um, diagnoses and data we found by rules, which then um, goes to the right code. And on the other hand, we having the machine learning, the KI system, which automatically analyzes the data of the last three years, for example, and see, ah, okay, in uh, 80 or 90% of the cases here, you came to these results. So we um, propose that to you. We can just um, go to the next page. So once again, we're taking all data we get, most of the data of the hospital information system, but there are a lot of more satellite systems like um, medical data banks, um, care system, et cetera. And that's what I said before, very often it grow organic in the hospital. So this is not all in a um, intelligent um, data structure base. These systems are uh, working alone. A lot of them are not, uh, don't have any um, bi-directional interfaces um, and that where it makes it very difficult. So what we do is um, we don't rely on them. We extract the data from all of these different sources um, locally on a, a dedicated server or on a part um, of the hospital server via a, um, um, 
I use that, that um, uh, visual machine. And um, so we don't have this data protection um, problem in this case because the hospital, the data stays in the hospital and the data can be organized um, and analyzed there. And from there, um, the information um, goes out with um, coding uh, proposals. Um, it gives um, uh, alerts if um, information is um, missing here or um, dedicates um, cases where you can have a look at it once in a while. So this is the book business model. So if we take a look now on um, the next page, um, that's how we sell it to the hospitals because they need to finance it, as I said. Uh, we have um, the goal to increase the coding quality that helps the hospitals that they have less checks from the health insurance or in Germany from the Medizinischen Dienst mit, where they also get by the new law, they also are um, uh, have the problems to have penalty um, payments if they don't code right. So that's something we do for the hospital because that's that's good for them right now for the budget. And of course, that's good for them later on for um, the analysis of the data if they use them for research and studies. Um, of course, they, uh, it decreases um, time because they don't have to read everything manually. They can really look into it in detail and see if everything is fine. And the data, that's the third point, comes out structured. And now if we have like a good coding quality, if you have structured data, then you have like a good base um, to work with this data um, in the hospital nationwide, but also towards a European um, data spot. We, of course, have this data protection system in place, but um, as we work with um, hospitals in France, we also work in Switzerland and we are about to find first clients in, uh, in Germany. Um, the problems and the uh, connection to each other, they are similar and um, we can help um, with um, our solution to find, for example, um, participants for, uh, for a certain um, research, because most of the research fail because they don't find the minimum amount of participants. So um, what is possible with our system, for example, is that um, you have a running study and you have a new patient who comes into um, the hospital and he gets the first diagnosis and first checkup. And if that fits the um, the qualification for the research and study. And for example, it could be possible that they, they get an email alert to the researcher and can work from there. So it's about to creating um, special uh, cohorts. So that is a possibility how to analyze data, structure data, and then use them for um, research in the hospitals. Yeah, that's um, my little overview of, um, um, of a company view of a business case. And um, yeah, I would be more than happy to, to discuss with you now and uh, to ask a question. Not sure if I was uh, completely clear about all that points and if that uh, helps you, because of course, it is not a, a regional or a cluster a point of view. It's really like a company point of view and we try to, to help from our point of view, the hospitals and um, yeah, and um, also the research and uh, clinical studies um, society. Thanks much, Michael. I think what's really important is, especially for people who are entering the data space conversation now, trying to figure out uh, how do you actually build a data-based, uh, data-driven business model is that these models already exist. Uh, and that there are uh, people already um, active in this emerging market. If it's okay, because we only have two more brief uh, inputs, hold the questions and then we'll, we'll see where we can take this. The, uh, there are two more colleagues who are a little bit closer to the Gaia X use case conversation that I briefly wanted to introduce. Uh, maybe we start with Tobias Greff, uh, August Wilhelm Scheer Institute. Uh, Tobias, I think as far as I know, you're involved in at least three Gaia X use cases and can maybe say a few things about where you think this conversation is from your perspective. So thanks a lot for the introduction, a short brief introduction from my person. My name is Tobias Kreff. I'm a research group leader at the AWS Institute. Um, we are from Saarland and we have developed um, three Gaia-X use cases, as mentioned before. 
and I will present a bit about this use cases. I will just share my screen. Um, so from my point of view, what I want to do today is to uh, give a short impulse because I realized that there are problems by um, exactly the case that we are creating multiple use cases in different domains actually. Um, and from my point of view, I just want to present you a re regional perspective from the Saarland, where we created two Gaia-X projects, one from the domain of e-learning, one from the domain of administration processes. And actually there are uh, several initiatives in our region too, from the health domain and to create data spaces from this point of view. If we look at um, the general aim of Gaia-X data spaces, then it is that personal data is highly sensitive, therefore in need of special protection. So what we are all aiming for is to spend up um, data sovereignty for the um, persons involved in this Gaia-X projects. So from a person's perspective, a citizen's perspective, um, there are three types of data, my personal dynamical data, static data, and data usage preferences. Sorry, you can't see what I'm... We can't see your presentation, we only do see your okay. Sorry, then I will just share the data screen. I hope you can see now the presentation. Okay, perfect. So now I'm switching again to the second slide. Um, the general aim of Gaia-X data spaces is that personal data is highly sensitive. So if you look at a um, certain citizen, then you have three types of data, personal dynamic data, static data, and typically um, my data usage preferences. So I always want to set up exactly my preferences, how my data will be used in the future, how my data is used actually, and how my data, which is aggregately used by, for example, a certain AI service will be used in the future too. And on the other side of this, that I have this tools which have to build up business models, my AI services and all these domains, which only work if I have agreed to share my data. Um, now we have built up three projects actually, um, and we have always this exact same problem for health domain, but all other domains besides these domains. So we have now set up three use cases, which I will present later for the education domain, public services, and what we heard before um, my presentation and afterwards, um, certain Gaia-X use cases for the health domain. And what I'm seeing actually is that we have always effects of creating new data silos because our use cases are very similar. I just want to give a short introduction to our project possible. This is a use case in the domain of the administration services because we have the general target of simplifying public processes with Gaia-X. Uh, it's a larger project um, which combines um, enterprises like Bechtle, Univention, which all are building up open source cloud data spaces for public domains in Germany. So if um, public organizations or uh, administration organizations um, in certain governments want to set up cloud services, they typically use this service, which is called Phoenix and the core of our Gaia-X use case and which we want to develop on further um, to set up cloud data services for the government domain. And therefore we will set up some data spaces all around these processes. So for example, if you want to set up um, some uh, patents or some, um, yeah, um, created, general um, processes for a healthcare domain, education domain, or higher education, where you have to set up some um, agreements all around the uh, rights or the governmental processes all around those domains, then you can use those platforms to set up some contracts or to set up some um, documents where you want to share with your government what you want to plan in the domains. And always they are working together SMEs, the education domain, or the open public as target groups and uh, groups, and they are sharing data via this collaboration open source tool with the administration data spaces. And exactly there, the AI services set up, for example, to choose exactly the right person at the government or the administration data space if someone gets ill to um, get connected over the whole process and to set the privacy 
um, of your documents and that people which are involved in the whole process can only look in the documents which they need for. Um, now you have exactly the same processes. And if you heard what I said in the education domain too, in the domain of healthcare, where our administration processes always um, part of the topics too. And um, this is a general um, topic for all the data spaces. If we look at the education domain, for example, we set up there the project Merlo, um, all around the topic lifelong learning with Gaia X. And there we set up data spaces all around different smart educational data. So for example, you can insert there your CVs, your career profile competencies, learner steps or learning content. But if you remind what I said before, that the, uh, typically these are um, data which are need to exactly address, for example, uh, a, a process in the administration domain to fit a, the right person to my process where I set up documents or exchange documents with the government domain. In the healthcare sector, if I, for example, so I'm searching for a, a, a doctor or a, someone who is uh, administrating my um, organization, then I need this educational profiles too. Um, in our Merlot project, we are setting up three services, a career assistance service, a life stage oriented training assistance, and an educational profiles forecast assistance. All these three services you can use in the healthcare domain too, or in the domain of public sector, where people are involved and where people are working on certain data sets. And from our point of view, we are setting up these three projects, and this is what I'm only aiming for. We want to exchange the um, yeah, information gathered, the data spaces which we set up to bring together all these three use cases, the healthcare data space and education data space and public and administration data spaces to find out which could be the synergies later on. We want to um, use this to um, get a transport, a transfer to and from Saarland. Um, and we want to initiate a regional network of stakeholders in Saarland from all three domains and government in 2022. Actually, we are initiating these three projects and we set up um, yeah, some larger network with people from the East Side Fab, which um, brings together our SMEs and our network to the governmental domain. Um, we, set, um, we spent this with the network from the education domain in Saarland. And we want to um, then bring together the synergies from all the street data spaces because you have always the same problem all around the street data spaces. If you were interested in to exchange your experiences um, to bring together the use cases, feel free to contact me or to add me at LinkedIn. Um, was just a short input and I hope I can um, later on discuss with you about exactly this problem. Super, thanks much Tobias. Also for suggesting that when we look at health, we keep in mind adjacent domains that, um, that might help us develop innovative use cases. In the GAIA-X group on smart cities, smart regions, for instance, last week, there was tremendous interest in linking to well-being and healthcare conversations. And maybe this is something that uh, we can also pioneer and pilot here in the region. Now we'll end with uh, our final contributor, which would be um, Christian Bugedein from Poly Poly. In some sense, we're returning back to the beginning because of the patient, the user, and the idea of a user-driven data governance approach. Um, Christian, tell us what you have in mind with Poly yeah. Poly. Uh, happy to. So um, there are two things that I'm going to talk about. Uh, the one is who and what Poly Poly is and what the mission of Poly Poly is. And the other is the Gaia X Health X Data Loft project, where we hopefully will participate under the leadership of the Charité uh, in Berlin. Um, I'll start with the second part and then tell you how Poly Poly ties into and how our special mission ties into that. I do not have a slide deck for the first for that first part that I'm going to talk about the data love because that is too big to show here and it would just be its own presentation and it would be just too much. So I'm just going to talk about it. I hope that's fine for everyone. Um, the Data Loft project is the idea that we have a unified data space that can be used to access health data from the different points 
of uh, contact in the patient's user journey. So imagine I have a bad back, I have surgery in some hospital, and afterwards um, I get rehabilitation, rehabilitation training where I uh, work with physiotherapists, with my doctor, and maybe come into the clinic for a checkup occasionally. And all uh, in the meantime, I uh, maybe low-key go to a gym or have my personal stepper at home to do some extra exercise. And I have a health tracker around my wrist, uh, around my wrist that keeps track of how many steps I'm doing, how many calories I'm burning, and that sort of thing. Maybe I have a a smart scale in my bathroom that monitors my weight for me. And all this data is generated and currently stored in separate silos or it just exists on paper somewhere. But when I go for my monthly checkup to see if my back is healing correctly, all that data is suddenly very interesting because my the, the doctor who does the checkup wants to see, am I doing my, my regular steps? Do I have a sudden weight loss maybe, or a sudden weight gain? Um, is my heart rate while I sleep proper? Um, do I have sleep apnea um, and, or what other things? So right now they're going to talk to me and hopefully I remember all the important things, but wouldn't it be nice if I could just say, here's all my health data related to my back. And then they could see, okay, here is the, uh, the X-ray picture from the hospital before and after. Here is the hospital report. Here is my step count. Here is uh, that I sleep soundly. And here is the report from my physiotherapist. And that is, in general, the vision that Dataloft wants to achieve by creating a data space where all these different contributors can store their data or provide an interface for that data. And then I, as a patient, can see that data and know, okay, these people have generated this data about me. And when I go somewhere to get checked out or get a medical opinion or further treatments, I can select efficiently that data and say, okay, here is the data that is relevant to what you're doing. But the thing that I talked about with my um, other therapist, where I talk about my head problems and my depression, that you do not see. Um, and I have, I should have a good interface where I can keep track of these things and keep track of who can still see my data and who I maybe do I want to revoke the access to. And that is this pro what this project is about, to create a unified data space for storing the data, processing the data, and most importantly, giving the patients the autonomy and the option to understand what data is there and how to give access to that or not. That ties in to the electronic patient uh, identity that we are starting to roll out in Germany and other systems, but it's mostly about how do we store the system on in the cloud on or on different systems in a way that we can report, here are the different data types stored on very different systems in a unified way. That is the the, uh, the very ambitious goal of this three-year project, where we are happy to work on. And Poly Poly and Specialty will work on the user interface for that. So how can we explain in plain language without going into jargon, where is my data? What data is there? What does that mean? And who can read that? Because I cannot give informed consent if I'm not informed. That is kind of in the word. And it's the problem that we see in a lot of places that deal with data about with data right now, that there is usually some pop-up, um, then a 30 pages long terms of service and privacy agreement. And then I just say, yeah, I want treatment. I want this. I say yes. And then I don't understand what actually happened. And that needs to change because otherwise no one will properly adopt that system. People want to feel informed and they want to see that they have a choice and that it needs to be a meaningful choice and a meaningful information. And that brings me to what Poly Poly is actually about. And for that, I can share my screen because I did prepare a bit. Um, hang on, I just need to share this thing correctly. 
So you should see a, a dark screen with just our logo on it. Perfect. Thanks. So Poly Poly has been created by uh, some people who a few years ago realized that in terms of data economy, as in who actually makes money from data and how, happens mostly without European input. The big players are all in the US and they all play to US laws and not necessarily to European privacy and data protection laws. That has a bunch of, uh, of effects. And the core thing is that data capital, as in I have data about people and I can work with that data, I can create business models out of that uh, by either directly catering to those people or creating services that deal with that data um, for, uh, in playing things, for example, advertisements, but also if we talk about medical data, if I can do research about the health thing of thousands of or millions of people and understand and can find patterns in that, I can create better medicine, better treatments that help everyone else then. And as a company, I can make money with that. So data capital fuels innovation and potentially also new business models. That means we have knowledge about customers, we know what the customer needs. And right now the problem is if we look at who has the bulk of data, that is with only a few monopolists. There are a few big, very, very big companies who have this very bright, um, wide array of data called, uh, looking into a lot of different niches of our lives. And if companies want to work with the data, they have to go through those monopolies, which has comes with a price, but it also gives those monopolies a very much amount of power over us as private citizens. And that is what we want to kind of tackle. So controlling data means controlling the value chains. And basically what I just said, this is centered around American very few companies. And we want to reclaim that data capital. We want to make sure that European companies that work with four Europeans don't have to take the detour or over the big pond. Um, so don't have the dependence to protect our own value chains and to have better digital business models and basically play a bit of catch up and make Europe a leader in the digital world again. Um, so to bring back this data capital, we as Poly Poly think that we need to have a decentralized ecosystem controlled by every European. Um, that is slightly not the Gaia X um, credo because the Gaia, Gaia X systems are all about cloud, but there are data, there is data that should be centralized or needs to be in the hands of the health providers because the hospital needs to have the patient folder. But afterwards, the data should live with me. I'm, I'm the one who is um, impacted by the data. It's my data, and that should be on my systems. So we want to have an alternative where we say the data should be on end user systems and that bypasses a lot of the growth and problems that central data storage has. So if I am a company and I need to store all the data about everyone whose life I'm going to impact, that means I need to store a lot of data. I need to expend a lot of money to store that data. Yes, storing a lot of data is cheaper at scale if I just have to store a bit of data, but it's still a lot of money. And the more data I store, the more money I need to spend. And the more data I have, the bigger is my liability. That means I need to make sure that that data is secure. I need to keep spending money to keep that data secure. If I do would not have that data, I would not need to spend that money. And that is a weakness that all the, the big data companies so, to a certain extent have. And it would be nice to be not beholden to that to not have that weakness, to have the strengths of all of these things, to have a centralized infrastructure for um, keeping track of what I'm doing, what is my core business, but not having that for everything that I do not absolutely need to do my business. Everything of data that is not 
absolutely needed by law or by practicality should not be on my systems. And that is what we're building. We're building something that we call the polypod. The polypod is very similar in many things to the solid pod. Um, solid is the new web standard pro uh, proposed by Jim Berners-Lee. And this, the difference with us is that the solid pod lives on the web and stores everything that you potentially want to share. The polypod, that is the system that we are building, lives on your own device and or devices and stores everything that you do not necessarily want to share. That might still be important and useful for other companies or for business partners or vendors or, or, or health providers, but you don't want to share it at all, basically. And these people still need to process that data. For example, um, as, a, as a medical practitioner, I have maybe um, a program that looks at the blood pressure charts over time and then tells me if this person is at risk. I don't need to see the chart in person necessarily. I need, just need to have that algorithm run on the data. And then that algorithm can come back and say, yes, this person is at risk. Now you should look at the chart. Um, that makes the doctor's life easier, but it also protects my privacy because that was a very simple system uh, suggestion. But if that algorithm is more complex that looks at when do I eat? How do I eat? What do I eat? When do I go to sleep? With whom do I go to sleep? How much steps do I do? And all these other things, and it's a complex thing, then I do not want to keep, hand over all that complex data to one person. But I would like to invite the algorithm to my data, have it run, and then come back with a result. And then I might need to have a more in-depth conversation with my, with my doctor, who they say, the algorithm flagged you as a um, a vulnerable group here, we need to talk about your habits regarding X. And then I have an informed discussion with my doctor. So what we want building is a system that keeps track of all our data, but necessar don't, don't necessarily gives it out. I don't share that data. I only invite algorithms to run on my systems and then give me results. And that means that the client or in health prospects, the patient is absolutely in charge of their data. They know this is what I have, this is what can what is being done with my data, and this is what I explain to other people, or this is what I show to other people. And that for us is utterly crucial, and that's why we're working with this Gaia X project uh, for the data loft, because there, that is where we explain and help explain this is the data that lives about you on a cloud server or on different people, on different people's computers. And this is what you need to know about this. And this is, these are the people who know about your data and who can access it. And if you want to give consent for a research institute to work with your data, you need to know what that means. And you need to understand that in plain ways. And you can see this on the slide that we have lots of graphics in our polypod. That is the thing that we're working most on, explaining what data about you means, what people can do with that data, and who actually has access to what. Because that is the part that makes informed consent informed. And without that, we shouldn't handle data of other people. If other people give us data, they give us a lot of trust. And we should first earn the trust and not say, yeah, yeah, trust us first, and then we'll hopefully prove you right. That is something where we are really, really uh, invested in. And we think as PolyPoly Poly, that this is a win for everyone. Clients gain better data protection. They can potentially get better services from, from companies that can make use of data from across several silos. And eventually they can even earn a digital income. And companies don't need to invest all the time into new infrastructure because they can make use of the supercomputers that we all have in our pockets. Uh, those people who are a bit older and remember using uh, eight or 16 bit computers, um, think about how much more powerful your smartphone is than a server from 2000. The servers that I was um, running for the 
company I first worked for were not half as powerful as a single low-end smartphone these days. We have supercomputers in our pockets and we should make use of them. And we as Poly Poly have, are creating a whole ecosystem there and we have three entities that work with that. That is the enterprise. Um, the enterprise works with other companies and works for other companies. That means if you as a company are interested in working with this ecosystem and need help on that, need an interface for that, that's where the Poly Poly interface comes, the enterprise comes into play. And we have a cooperative, a cooperative that is strictly owned only by citizens of the European Union. No company is involved there. The cooperative is fully independent from the enterprise, but it empowers the platform formed by all these decentralized systems. And it is there to represent the interests of the end users. And we find this very important that we have this clear um, definition of who works for whom and who is, who is representing whose interests and to not have that muddled. And on top of that, we have a foundation that has its ear on the legislative track, as we say, uh, where we help decision makers understand such an ecosystem and make sure that the legislation around this works and to basically help the other end entities work nicely together. And that is what Poly Poly does. And we're very, very excited to work with Charité and others to make this also work for the health se healthcare sector, because that is a sector we, as I'm, I'm an IT person and we have developers and designers, um, are only just beginning to really understand. So we're happy to have a big partner like Charité, for example, in there to help explain as many things. And that's it from my side. Cool, Christian, thanks much for this. I mean, I didn't expect this, but basically everybody in this debate presented a kind of a systems view. Um, and um, I'm not sure how to best follow up on this, but I first want to thank our colleagues from Zares uh, to even initiate this debate because it, we clearly need it here in the region. And I think what's very interesting is to think not so much uh, on the individual or company level, but in fact on the regional level. So I'm, um, I'm really happy that our colleagues from Scumbelt and Latvia started us off on the regional track. And then with Luxembourg on the question of what we might actually do in Saarland. Uh, to learn from these other pioneering regions, because Germany as a whole has not exactly been um, the fastest um, mover in the digital um, healthcare space. Um, uh, Baltic uh, um, actors have been much quicker. And then, of course, to end on this data literacy note, to say that we all need to know more about what potential health data is. The federal strategy, for instance, for healthcare data already includes data from environmental sensors or suggest that we include environmental data in our health data conversation. So it's a moving target. And it's also clear that this is not just about individual business models, but about how intelligent the system as a whole is. So Michael, thanks again for alerting our attention to the data generated by the processes of the system itself. This is not medical data per se, but data that is generated by basically processing the actors in the system. And that too needs to become more intelligent but is also the source of value creation. And we're only beginning to understand the wide range of values that are being created in the system. Not all of them will be realized in markets. Some of them might just be realized as lower healthcare cost, faster processes, more self-determination, more trust or whatever. Um, so we do have, I think, Natalie, a couple of minutes for maybe closing statements, if that's what you wanna do. Uh, Maybe we can do a final round where each of you says, okay, this is something I'm taking away from the conversation and this is something I wanna do next, you know, based on this kind of exchange. And uh, if you have enough on your plate and don't wanna do anything else, then that's fine too. Um, but I'd be very happy to see if there's anything that is of relevance to what we do here in the region. So who wants to start? Oliver, give us your checkout yes. statement. Thank you, Sönke. Yes, uh, what I would like to uh, remark is um, Skanbald is an initiative for political activity. So we would like to get use of the um, uh, presidencies of the European uh, um, Council uh, to, to bring forward the European health data space. 
you have all uh, mentioned really relevant um, practical examples of yeah, use cases, very fruitful use cases. I would like to invite you to join the Skalmwelt Initiative, really to use these good examples and transform it in a political um, dimension and really show what to the European Commission what we need as a framework for European data space. Because what Skandal we already like to mention is the data space is already there, but we need a framework to bring it on a higher level and to really make it workable for, for European Union. So this is an invitation to all of you to, to join our initiative. Just stay in contact with me and Skandbald. Thanks, Matt. I also think that this the work that went into creating these declarations makes it easier for those of us that are just now entering the conversation. You know, because you actually, yeah. this, declarations like this lower the threshold for people who are just now joining the conversation. So thanks again for that. Michael, you had your hand up too. Yeah, um, thanks again, um, everybody for, for your distributions. I think there were um, some really important um, uh, topics raised. Um, when we talk about um, data and data rooms, um, I think um, if I refer to Christian, I, I think we have to take a look on Europe, um, in the United States, and also in, in China and in Asia. Um, they use data in a different way and they have different possibilities to use um, data. Of course, China, in China, you know about uh, the systems. They have a lot of people. They have a lot of um, data. They develop very fast in, 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 in AI and also in, in health section. Um, if we look over the Atlantic uh, to the USA, yes, Christian, you're absolutely right. There is a lot of big companies who, use, who, who own the data because um, we know, for example, about, um, about um, yeah, let's say, um, let's say attempts um, which which we are successful which are successful of these big companies they they provide um, solutions like we do to the hospital for free but they own the data afterwards you know something what we will never have here in europe because data and health data is belongs to the patients um, should be used by hospitals in anonymized way um, for clinical research um, but we have challenges here. Um, we have seen that in Germany during the COVID crisis that health um, is a, a federal topic, you know. So we have even problems in Germany to get on a um, on a on a certain um, um, uh, policy. In the European nation, um, European Union, we have a lot of different point of views, and that is why I think, um, Oliver, also your initiative is um, very important to work politically towards that to get like this administration um, in a way that is usable for for companies, for organizations, for for clusters, and yeah, that's what makes it for us in Europe much more complicated to move forward, to develop, to research, um, um, to getting um, science in the next uh, dimension as we uh, see that in, in the US or in, in China or in the rest of Asia. Thanks, Michael. Uh, of course, all those big bad boys and you know platform owners, etc., have all joined GaiaX already. Uh, you know, all the hyperscalers are part of GaiaX. But I think the hope is that as Europe kind of rediscovers its soft regulatory power, is that this means that hopefully, um, in the future, even these players will have to play by rules that we have co-designed. And I think that's one of the big promises of the GaiaX conversation is that maybe we can change the rules of the game here. Uh, Christian, you had your hand up. Christian, you're still muted, I think. Right, thank you for reminding. So um, what I think is we should stop thinking about this. We have an either or question. We have data protection or we can use data and have a data economy and have all the interesting things that we can do with data. It needs to be both. And it's possible to do both. That's the thing. And that's the beauty of uh, the, the 
European mindset where we say we have a strong data protection mindset and we should look at China, at the US and at possibilities, what can we do with data? And then we should figure out how can we do the same thing, but still protecting it, still doing it in a way where we put the individual into the center and say, these are, these are the people who, who, con who need to consent to that and who need to be able to opt out, but still deliver all the, those interesting big data services. And we think what we would poly poly do is a small step or maybe a big one into the right, into that direction. And that's why I was very infused about this panel because when I heard every one of you, all these projects have this, this part in there. How can we make sure that the data, what we have, that we use, we use ethically, that we use it in a way that people can consent to it, that they can control what, they, what happens with their data. And I think that's the takeaway that um, this needs to happen in a way to take along the individuals and help them there and use, I don't want to say grassroots structures, but use P, uh, um, take into account what the individuals want to do and need to do. Yeah, thanks also for that reminder that um, even if we can't always think of a business model, that doesn't mean that we're not already creating value you know, by making the whole process and the system more trustworthy. Um, and I think especially in these times after the pandemic, uh, creating a uh, trust uh, in the healthcare process is, um, is a goal in and of itself. Tobias, you also had your hand up. Yeah, thanks a lot. What is most relevant for me in the context of the discussion is that we share use cases across the board. So join the Gaia-X hubs at national level, regional level, European level, and help prevent new zeros. Um, because I see that we don't do this in common and I hear everywhere the same topics and targets and aims again. Let's prevent that we all rethink similar topics and bring the commonalities together. That's just my statement. Thanks much for that. I also just, I mean, I'm, an, I'm a humanities guy, okay? So I, I'm barely touching the, uh, the data literacy complexities here, but I was very welcome in the Gaia X uh, conversation. So I can only encourage every one of you to maybe take part of this conversation into the Gaia X design context. Um, there is already, um, at least in the German hub, there is a cross thematic uh, working group. So beyond health versus smart city, smart regions versus this and this and this and this. Um, and that might also be a context uh, for use case development. But I also think, and we'll follow up on this uh, here in the region, the offer from Luxembourg to start thinking about uh, another trans-border use case, um, I think was very um, useful and welcome and we should definitely follow up on this because that was, that's what makes it European. You know, the GAIA-X as, as, as just a, a selection of national use cases only makes so much sense because it doesn't help us understand the European dimension of it all. Um, not sure what else there is to say other than tons of things. Um, thank you for taking uh, time out of your busy schedules to share. Um, and um, I hope uh, we'll uh, see you again in some other context.